storm clouds are definitely coming. That's what we'll find out on this week's Watchman video broadcast. Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchmen Studios with another Watchmen video broadcast. Let me show you what I mean by storm clouds are coming. I was doing a study for a future Watchmen broadcast, future Pastor Mike Online, concerning GOG, G-O-G, not God, G-O-D, GOG, G-O-G, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1. Let me show you what I mean. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Let me stop you right here. I've read a lot of books on Bible prophecy in my lifetime. I've watched, you know, the big guys, Jack Van Impey and all these others, talk about Gog and Meshach and Tubal, saying it's got to be Russia. It's Russia. It's Russia and Germany. And it's got to be Meshach is Moscow. And it's all of this. And I noticed that he says a chief prince. Well, I know from Ephesians chapter 6 what a chief prince really is. For we, this is verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And then to make sure that we're clear on this, he says, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So that led me to think that possibly, in fact, I would say probably, Gog, who is a chief prince, is not a man. It's not a group of men, it's not an earthly king, it's not an earthly land. Gog is a devil. Gog is a chief prince. We have evidence of that in other places in the Bible. We have Michael, who is the chief prince of the people of Israel. We have, uh, we have Lucifer, who is a prince. He is a prince of the power of the air. And so anytime I see prince, like in um, Ezekiel 28, where it talks about the prince of Tyrus, and then it goes on to explain the devil, how he was covered with all these stones, he had musical instruments uh, built into his body, and so on. And so there's no doubt now in my mind that Gog, while he is a chief prince over a group of people, let's say it could be the Russians, but Gog himself is a principality, a prince, a high, very high ranking devil. There's a lot of things in Ezekiel 38 that if you go through it with honest eyes and you believe the Bible, you believe what it says, you'll see that this army that Gog leads comes in riding on horses. Now, you could say, well, horses now mean tanks and jeeps, but it doesn't say that. And it doesn't say that here, and it doesn't say that anywhere else in the Bible. You could say, well, all they had back then was horses, but now we have jeeps and tanks and Humvees and personnel carriers, and, but it doesn't say that either. It says they come in riding on horses, and it says that they're still using bows and arrows and spears and People haven't fought that way for over 100 years, 150 years. They haven't fought that way in a long, long time. So it's just hard for me to imagine that Russia would build this massive army 
all on horseback and come in against the Israeli army with nothing more than bows and arrows. It just, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be how it is. So I think that Gog really is a spirit, and this is a spiritual army, an army of devils, literally, to come against the land of Israel. We have, uh, let, me, let me finish reading this. Verse 3 again, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So, again, they're all carrying swords. They're using bucklers and shields. They are riding on horses, all right? Not the way the Russian army fights modern warfare, all right? So, I believe that this is a different type of army, an army of devils that's coming down to invade the land of Israel. Then, in verse 9, and this is what got me thinking about this particular subject, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Now, I do believe that it's possible that they will include human soldiers. But I think an army of devils, very fierce, very evil. And just think about it. How many, how many angels, how many... How many species or creatures are in the angelic realm? The Bible says that it is an innumerable amount. And we know that one third of all of that innumerable amount of angels are part of an army that Satan musters in the last days to try to take over heaven and they all get kicked out. That's what we know. But it said that they're coming like a storm and they shall be like a cloud to cover the land. This description matches the description of an army mentioned in the book of Joel. Yes, Joel's army. Joel chapter 2, verse 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, Neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And there's a lot of things in the book of Joel that we're not going to cover today. What we're going to focus on is this idea, trying to understand what God meant when he referred to the army of Gog coming in like a storm and to be like a cloud to cover the land. So here's what we're going to do. Let's study clouds. Let's study clouds in the sure word of prophecy. And remember, what we're going to see from this book, in the next however long it takes me to deal with this, what we're going to see is we're going to try to unfold what the Bible is telling us is going to happen in the last days. We're going to use... Uh, some of the rules of interpretation, but not man's rules. We're going to look at some of the rules given to us in the Word of God for interpreting Scripture. And the only right way to interpret Scripture is to use Scripture and more Scripture and lots of Scripture. And I believe that we have the very words of God right here and this authorized King James 1611 version Bible. I think everything in this Bible is right. I think it qualifies under the rules of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. If any man speak in an unknown, let it be unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. Originally the Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Three unknown languages to most people. And then he says, let one interpret or one translate and here we have one translation of three unknown tongues and in this one translation even though these words were written over the span of thousands of years 
They're all tied together by a single language and by words that tie one part of the Bible in with another. Remember, one of our rules uh, of interpreting Scripture is in Isaiah chapter 28. Uh, he's talking about the drunkards of Ephraim. And he says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. So, understanding things from the Bible, if you just read Ezekiel 38, you may be scratching your head going, I don't think I understand that very well. And that's what some people do. They limit their understanding of one part of the Bible to only reading that part of the Bible. But God himself said it's line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. And so that's what we do. We're going to study the words of the Bible, particularly the word cloud. Now, what I've included here in this study is all the variations in the King James of the word cloud, clouds, cloudy. I don't think there's cloudingly. I don't think that's a word. So, but anyway, you get the idea. PureBibleSearch.com. Download and install for Windows, Mac, or Linux. Any of those three. Free software. And you'll study only the King James Version of the Bible. You just type in the word cloud and put a little asterisk right after the letter D in there, and it'll pull up every place in the Bible where clouds are mentioned. You can do your own study on this, and you may find things that I, number one, have never seen before, but you may find and under th understand things from the Bible that I won't cover in this study. And, but God will bless you with it. I promise you, you will. So let's study... Uh, let's take these rules then and use them to try to understand what God meant when Gog and his army are going to come in like a storm and as a cloud to cover the land. Remember, the day of the Lord is a day of clouds. So let's try to understand from the Bible what that means. First place we're going to go, Revelation chapter 1. I love this. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and what which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So from this verse, we understand that Jesus' coming, his second coming, is a coming that is associated with clouds. Remember, the day of the Lord is a day of clouds and of thick darkness. And so the coming of the Lord and the appearing of the Lord, he said that when he appeared, he's coming in the clouds. Now, I get this idea of not a bright, sunshiny day, but a day literally that's overcome with clouds and Jesus is going to appear in that cloud. Do we have any other places? Do we have a second witness in the Bible of the fact that Jesus is coming in the clouds? Yes, we do. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. Stop right here. This idea of the sun being darkened, the moon shall not give her light or the moon turning to blood, the stars either not shining, giving their light, or the stars falling from heaven. Remember, Lucifer, Satan, and his army, one-third of the angels, which is all the devils, they get cast out, and they get cast out of heaven, and they fall. That's the stars falling from heaven to the earth. This idea, you see it many places in the Bible. The book of Isaiah, chapter 13, Joel, chapter 1, 2, and 3, Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 12, of course, Matthew chapter 24. You see it many, many places in the Bible. And this event, I think, is tied in with a lot of other things that are taking place in the Bible, including Gog coming down with his army to invade the land of Israel. Let's pick it back up here. Matthew chapter 24. 
The sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Notice that it's the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. That's what the book of Revelation says. With power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. I love this. I love this. Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, is going to appear in the heaven in the clouds. That's the sign that he said. He said, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. He's going to appear in the clouds. Then he's going to send his angels. The trumpet's going to sound. He's going to gather together his elect. That's the gathering, just like the parable of the wheat and the tares. They gathered that's what the, the language that the King James uses. They gathered together first all of the tares, all of the wicked. Then they gathered together all of the wheat and put it in the, the barn, the garner. That's heaven. That's the gathering together of the elect. But notice that the gathering of the tares came first. Then the gathering together of the elect. Okay, We'll touch on that. I've already spoken about that in other videos, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But they shall gather together as elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And the sign of that happening is that Jesus is appearing in the clouds. Mark talks about this. Luke mirrors this. The synoptic gospels, all three of them, sort of give a little bit different view of the same thing that Matthew's talking about in Matthew chapter 24. Now, I mentioned the wheat and the tares because in Revelation chapter 14, we see one that looks like the Son of Man. If it looks like the Son of Man, it's the Son of Man. And notice the description here as he is putting his sharp sickle into the earth for that harvest time. Revelation 14, verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. That, to me, references Matthew 13, verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? And from whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while we gather up the tares, ye rid up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first, see it? First the tares. Bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now, stop right here. I think it's very important that he mentions that the tares were gathered first. Then you have the gathering of the saints, the gathering of the elect, because 2 Thessalonians 2 tells us that there is something that happens first before the gathering together of the elect. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken, because at the day of the Lord there's a shaking taking place. Earth is shaken, the heavens are shaken, and when you shake the heavens, something falls out of them. Stars, like figs from a fig tree. That be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. 
let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So to me, this falling away happening first coincides with the gathering of the tares, the shaking that's going to happen in the day of the Lord, the Son of Man in the cloud with a sharp sickle gathering. It's the time of harvest. It's the reaping time. And just like we see here in verse 30, gather you together first the tares, then gather the wheat into my barn. I think that there's something that happens prior to us being gathered together when Jesus appears in the clouds. So then Jesus then explains the meaning of the parable. Later on in Matthew chapter 13, verse 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth a good seed is the Son of Man. That's the same expression used back in Revelation 14. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore, and stop right here, that's what he said in Matthew 24. He's sending the reapers, which are the angels. In Matthew 24, he's sending the angels out to do what? To gather together his elect. And what is the sign of all of that happening? It's the Son of Man appearing in the clouds. The reapers are the angels. Verse 40, as therefore the tares are gathered together and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. He said the righteous shall shine forth as the sun. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, see we're, we're doing what the Bible says. We're taking here a little and applying it to there a little. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he talks about the day of the Lord so coming as a thief in the night. And he says, ye are all children, uh, ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And he says here that we're going to shine forth as the sun. So I think all of these are speaking of the one and the same event. The time when Jesus is going to appear in the clouds. First, he's gathering together the tares, shaking the heavens and the earth and the stars falling and the sun being dark and the moon being turned to blood. All of these things are taking place in the day that Jesus appears in the clouds. Matthew chapter 26, here's another passage where he's referring to coming in the clouds. Verse 63, but Jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the son of God. Jesus saith unto him, thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And of course, you know, after that, they rent their clothes. Ah, he said it. They, they were furious at Jesus because they knew. They knew the Old Testament prophecies. They knew that the day of the Lord was a day of clouds. And they're going, did I, did I just hear this? Did he just say this? He said he's coming in the clouds. Well, that's the day of the Lord. He's saying, and they ripped their clothes in anger. Ah, but Jesus wasn't lying and he wasn't kidding. He's coming again. They knew, they knew what was in the right hand of God. And they knew that Jesus sitting at the right hand of God because some of them were from the tribe of Benjamin. You know what Ben Yamin means? Son of the right hand. Oh, and they're just nuts over this, furious. But Jesus is coming back. He's coming. He's seated at the right hand of the Father right now, where the book is. And when he appears, he's coming in the clouds. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. Here we have another passage talking about 
God appearing in the cloud. After six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias, which is Elijah, with Moses. They were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. Can you, can you imagine this? Peter seeing Elijah alive, Moses alive. By the way, both Moses and Elijah have stories that deal with the Lord appearing in a cloud, right? So we had Elijah, how did he get to heaven? By a whirlwind, a chariot of fire and a horse of fire, a whirlwind, a pillar of cloud, right? So we have Peter and he's just going, oh, uh, we could build three tabernacles for all three of you. It, the Bible said he didn't know what to say. He was just like coming off the top of his head. He was just in awe. Oh, I, would, I would be too. Only I wouldn't be saying thing anywhere near as lucid as what Peter said. I'd be going, uh, uh, like that, right? Man, I love, and I think on that day, People are going to be in awe at the vision of Christ appearing in the clouds. They're just going to be going like that, all right? And I think a lot of people are going to be going, uh-oh. All that stuff them Christians said on YouTube, that's happening right now, all right? And then, on top of all of that, Jesus now turning bright as the sun, Verse 7, there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Seven words there. Because when God speaks, it's perfect. So, you're getting the sort of the scenario, the picture, the setup from the Bible. When Jesus appears in the clouds, here's God in a cloud, a voice coming out of a cloud. And we're going to look, we're going to go in the Old Testament. We're going to get an understanding of why this happened this way. Because God is such a glorious being. I hate to use that word, but there's no other way to, we don't have words that can adequately describe God. But because God is such a glorious being, us seeing God in our flesh would kill us instantly. God is so glorious and so full of radiance and joy and peace and love and glory and fascination and awe and there's not even words to describe him. Every time you see God in the Old Testament, he's like hiding behind a cloud. There is a cloud that's between us and him, and you ought to thank God that there is. Because if God revealed himself the way he is to mankind, it would kill us all. So that, that's what I see here. And what we're seeing is on this day, God is going to reveal to the whole world that the one in the cloud is his beloved son and he speaks for God. And everything that Jesus said conveyed that to the people that lived during his day and to us that if Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. I and the father are one. I am of my Father. My Father sent me and my Father gave me the words to say. Jesus then tells us in Hebrews that lo I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will O God. And so the volume of this book 
is going to tell us everything that Jesus is coming to do. We have another one in Luke chapter 12, verse 54. Here's Jesus telling us about the sign of the clouds associated with his coming. He said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, there cometh a shower, and so it is. Let me stop right here. I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but I know that here in Missouri, in the Midwest, the United States, 90% of our weather systems come from the West. They moisture coming out of the Pacific Ocean or the Gulf of Mexico, rising up, going east a little bit, but then coming back from the West. As I'm speaking right now, the news here is that there is a storm system. Right now, it's way down deep in the Pacific Ocean. But they can already predict that this storm system, this low pressure system, I feel like a weatherman, this low pressure system is coming out. It's going to come out of the west, over the Rockies, and it's going to develop. It's going to pull that moisture in from the Gulf of Mexico. And when those two things combine together with the cold weather that we're having right now, we're, we're like giddy. We're going to get like seven or eight inches of snow. All right. We get that once, two, three times, maybe a winter. Sometimes we don't get any, which is a big letdown for people like me. But anyway, this is true for us. We get most of our weather from the west, a cloud from the west. So he says, verse 55, when you see the south wind blow, you say there will be heat and it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. But how is it that you do not discern this time? And I really think that you have a lot of people in this world who say they believe in God, they believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. They say they kind of believe the Bible. But they have absolutely no discernment concerning the times that we're living in right now. And I think that when Jesus appears in the clouds, I think it's going to catch a lot of so-called Christians off guard because they have no biblical discernment whatsoever. One of the things that I know God has put into my heart and called me to do is to not be the one who gives everybody everything that there is to know about the Bible. I don't know it all. My job is to give you enough so that you can then go to the Bible yourself and discern the clouds, discern the sky, discern the time. Instead of following all the YouTube video bloggers or the blogs themselves or Facebook memes, instead of you getting your knowledge about end times and prophecy from that, you're a student of the Word. And what you're going to get from God is going to come from God to you by way of the words that are in this book. But he mentions the clouds here because the clouds are part of that discernment. We are going to learn what the cloud means. Acts chapter 1. Jesus lived in this world. We talked about that in a previous Watchman, how after his resurrection he was there for 40 days. That's a time prophecy. It takes discernment to understand what that time prophecy is all about. But here now, he's leaving them. And he told them that he was going to leave. But he also told them, I'm going to send you the comforter, so don't worry. I'm not just going to leave you up to yourselves. And God did not do that. God gave us the Holy Spirit. And the codified form of that Holy Spirit is right here in the words of this book, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, their spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the gifts of the Spirit, right here in this book. Everything that Jesus does is by the book. That's from his own mouth, by the way. So in Acts chapter 1, he leaves. And you remember what the angels said, right? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea 
and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So we've already seen enough. We're going to see more. But we've already seen enough to tell us that Jesus coming and his appearing is going to be in the clouds. It was a cloud that received him out of their sight. He just keeps going up and up and up and up. And then they can't see him anymore. And the angels that came, and, and these angels walk up, and all these disciples are going. They're hoping he, you know, like, will come back down or something like that. The two angels are just walking in amongst these disciples, and they're all doing this. Uh, you mean of Galilee. Why are you gazing? Right? This same Jesus. The same Jesus. He's coming back. How you see him leave? Well, that's how he's coming back. John was one of those. And John here, Revelation 1, that's where we started, is writing and saying, he's coming back in the clouds. So, I've always been a fan of typology, a student of typology, a teacher of typology. I think everything in this Bible is a foreshadowing of the first and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I even believe that the first coming of Christ establishes the scenario and the typology for the second coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, We've already seen multiple places that when Jesus comes, the sign of his coming is that he's coming in the clouds. Well, what about his first, his first appearing in this world? It wasn't when he was baptized by John. It wasn't when he did his first miracle. His first appearing in this world was when he was born a baby in a manger. There's something, when I was a, when I was a, a boy, um, I had to learn Luke chapter 2 and the, the, what they call the Christmas story. I had to learn that from memory because I was in a school play. So I learned like the first 14 verses by heart. And part of that was that Mary took Jesus, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger. But then I remembered that the angels gave that one sign as the particular sign of how the shepherd, I mean, you can imagine in Bethlehem, there's probably more than one baby that would be born, more than one pregnant woman, right? So how would the shepherds know? Which one was the Savior, Christ the Lord? That particular sign was given to them. And what does that mean? Why does the Bible have to go out of its way to give you this detail of how Christ was born and what Mary did? I mean, I looked up swaddling, which I encourage you to do. Swaddling is something that Every mom teaches her daughter how to take a newborn baby, because the newborn's been in the womb for nine months, and they're used to being tightly packed together like a burrito, okay, or a pita, or any, you know, any country in the world that wraps stuff in bread. That's what babies are used to being like in their first weeks after being born. They're not happy all splayed out like this. They want to be tightly, so they... Mamas teach their daughters how to take babies and wrap them up real tight to swaddle 
them. It's a gift. It's an art form, all right? But why this one sign? What was so significant about that? So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now in verse 10, the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Notice that. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. All babies born are wrapped in swaddling clothes. So why is this any particular important sign? Out of all the details that could be mentioned about Mary giving birth to Jesus and baby Jesus himself, why is it focused now twice on the swaddling clothes? I wanted to know. I, God laid that on my heart one day to study, to search that out, to seek it out. And the first time I looked at the word swaddling or swaddled in the Bible, I didn't get it. And it wasn't until that I really focused on this sign of Jesus appearing. And let me stop here for a minute. I may not know what this is absolutely going to be like when the event actually happens. But we know that there's Christ and we know that there's anti Christ. We know there's Jesus and we know there's another Jesus. We know that there's the lion of the tri tribe of Judah and we also know that Satan walketh to and fro as a roaring lion. So, we have the real and we have the fake. How would we know which one is which? When Jesus appears, I think by that time the man of sin has already made his appearance. And there's no doubt in my mind that billions of people all over the world are going to select and choose the other Jesus, the wrong Jesus, the one who appears as God, showing himself that he is God, the one who is not God, they're going to pick him. And they're going to abandon Jesus. They have they can look at clouds and say, clouds coming out of the west, it looks like rain. I, I feel storms coming in my bones. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, all right? So they have discernment on clouds. They have no discernment on the second coming, and people are going to pick the wrong Jesus. So I think that the clouds are highly significant here, that his coming is in the clouds. And the sign that was given to the shepherds about him being wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. What was that about? So then I found it. Back in the book. And when I saw this, I was already of the belief that the King James was the right Bible. But when God showed me this, I remember tears coming into my eyes. You know, hair standing up on the back of my neck and I was in awe because I realized that there was only one Bible in the whole world that gave this kind of detail one language interpreting three different languages tying things not only separated by language barriers but tying things together separated by thousands of years here Job, we believe that Job was actually the first one to write anything down from the Bible because Job apparently was a contemporary, lived around the time of Abraham, and the first, you know, five books of the Bible were written by Moses. Moses came 400 years after Abraham and Job. So we believe that Job was actually the first guy to write down things in the Word of God. And so we have the earliest writing of God's Word giving to us the most significant detail or giving us the understanding 
and the most significant detail of the second coming and the first coming of Jesus Christ. Let me get to it. Job 38. Because God is now at the end of the book of Job. And God is tying it all together for Job, giving him understanding. And he says, Job, where was thou when? That's the question. I laid the foundations of the earth. Declare if thou hast understanding. So we tie that together with verse 9. Where was thou when I made the cloud the garment thereof and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, meaning the earth? Do you get that? The clouds are the swaddling clothes. Because he said the cloud was the garment and thick darkness the swaddling band. Clouds and thick darkness are the signs of the day of the Lord. The day, it is a day of clouds and of thick darkness, the Bible says. So here's Mary. She's wrapping her son. She's clothing him. The Lord is appearing in a cloud. That's what the swaddling clothes, the swaddling band that Mary wrapped Jesus in represented. His coming is in the clouds. Even his first coming because of the swaddling band that Mary wrapped him in, Job said, represent the clouds and thick darkness. When Jesus came the first time, he came in the clouds. When he comes the second time, he's coming in the clouds and the thick darkness, which is the swaddling band of the earth. One Bible gives you that kind of detail. And when I saw that for the first time, I was absolutely 100% convinced that every word in this Bible was the word of God. Because only God can tie it together like that. Books separated by thousands of years, separated by three different languages, all tied together for us in the last days to give us understanding that Jesus, when he comes, he's coming in the clouds. Take a look at this picture here. This is a rainbow in the clouds. Think about a story. What that rainbow in the cloud means. Genesis chapter 9. We are given the reason why. We, and st stop and think about what a rainbow actually scientifically is. All right. See, there's science behind what God does in this world. There's knowledge and facts that you, know, you can't deny. There are really things called clouds in the sky. And what are they? We know them to be tiny little water droplets that are supported by the firmament, the atmosphere, the expanse of the sky. I mean, water's heavy. And all of that water in, held up in the air is held up by the pillars of heavens is air pressure. High pressure means no clouds. Low pressure, all of that water starts falling out of the sky because it's heavy, right? So, what is a rainbow? It is the light of the sun, and who's the sun? Jesus, the Bible, right? It's the light of the sun hitting those water droplets in the clouds, the water droplets acting like a prism, separating out how many bands of color? Do you know this one? Seven. It's exactly seven bands. All these different colors separate it out, you see that there's seven of them. They're different. Now, when I take yellow and red and blue and purple crayons, if I took seven of those colors in crayons and melted them all together or colored them on the page, I wouldn't get white. But for some reason, all of those different seven colors, when they're all grouped together, they make white light. I don't understand that, but that's just how it is. Okay? So we understand the science behind it. Now let's understand the symbol of it. So when we go back to Genesis 9, when God introduces rainbows into the world, and for the reason that he does, we're going to see that the rainbow is Jesus. 
Genesis 9, verse 8, God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you. Notice this, it's a covenant. And with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl and of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature which is, that is with you for perpetual generation. Stop right here. A token is a sign. Right? What was the sign of Jesus' first coming? It's wrapped in swaddling clothes. What's the sign, the token of his second coming? He's coming in the clouds. So God is tying this in with Mary wrapping him in swaddling clothes. And the angel saying, that's the sign. That's how you know it's him. Because he's in the clouds. So, verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth. That the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow, who's the bow? It's Jesus, shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I establish between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Are you, did you see that? I remember reading that for the first time with that understanding. And I was just, I was going, this is a... How many times does he say, this is the token, this is the token, this is the covenant, this is the sign of the covenant. I'm, this is God. You know, a, a covenant is a contract. And a contract means nothing unless it's signed. God signed this contract. It's an agreement that he made with earth, and it's an unconditional agreement. God didn't say, I'll never do this again as long as you don't sin anymore. He never said that. There is nothing on this world that man or any creature does to merit God destroying the earth again or not destroying the earth again with water. God just said, I'm going to do this. It's a promissory. It's a covenant. It's a contract. God signed it himself with the token it's like a seal or a signet. You put wax on a paper, the king stamps his ring in there or uses a cylinder seal to roll it out in the clay or whatever. But either way, it is God's signature of his son, the bow, the light, the colors of the rainbow, the seven colors in the, and he said, it's in the cloud. Surely he was showing us Jesus in the clouds. So when Jesus comes the first time, that is God, Mary wrapping him in the swaddling band of the earth, the clouds, that is God's signature that he's fulfilling his covenant. And the covenant is the new covenant that God can forgive all of our sins and that he will not pour out his wrath on us ever again. I love this. When I talk about numbers, I get happy when I talk about typology. And I use the term apocalyptic language. I learned that term in college, Bible college. They applied it in, they attributed the book of Revelation along with other Greek documents around that time they said the book of Revelation falls into a category of literature called apocalyptic literature. And my professor said that there were scores of other works written around the time of the book of Revelation whereby it prophesied cataclysmic events. And it really kind of upset me because among the scholars, they took the whole book of Revelation and, and ascribed it to 
a group of other documents predicting things that were going to happen that probably never happened. In other words, Book of Revelation is just another one of these documents. And they said it's written in apocalyptic language, meaning that it was written in a sort of a metaphorical language, and what John really meant by beast was the emperor of Rome. Like John was afraid to write out, the emperor of Rome is evil. Like John was, John was on the Isle of Patmos in exile because the emperor of Rome didn't like what he was saying. Like John was afraid to say it again. John's going, they can't hurt me. They tried to fry me in oil and that didn't work. They didn't kill me then. They're not going to kill me now. I'm 95 years old. What do I care? So I don't believe that. And it just kind of angered me. But this idea of apocalyptic language, let me tell you what the word apocalypse means. Apocalypto means revealed. And I believe that there is apocalyptic language in the scripture. Not the, the way the world views the word apocalypse as doom and gloom and terrible things happening. But apocalypse in the true meaning of the word. It's a language structure that actually reveals the symbolisms behind things in the Bible. And the clouds are part of that apocalyptic language that's in your King James Bible. When I see the bow in the cloud, I don't think bad things have happened. The storm has passed. And usually you see the rainbow after the storm, not before. The storm clouds pass, the sun is out, but it's hitting upon those clouds as they're passing by. And that's, you know what I love to see? A double rainbow. You ever seen one of those? Because I go, that's the first coming, that's the second coming right there. Isn't it great? Aren't you? It, I hardly ever miss when somebody says, hey, there's a rainbow. I run to the window or I run outside to see it. Why? Because I know what it means. I know that that rainbow is Jesus. Okay? He's the light shining through the clouds, the water. The water is the word of God. This is revelation here. This is the light displayed out in the seven vibrant colors giving us knowledge of the glory of the Son of Man, the Son of God appearing in the clouds in the last days. Genesis 9, one of my favorite places in the Bible because God is showing forth the coming of His signature, Jesus Christ, the token of the covenant. That, in Genesis 9, gives you an understanding of what we see in, in Ezekiel chapter 1 when Ezekiel saw the throne of God, when he first saw this, he saw a cloud coming. Right? Ezekiel chapter 1, go read it. And this is what he said he saw. Above the firmament that was over their heads, he's talking about the four living creatures, was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This, look at this, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Do you see what Ezekiel saw? First of all, he sees, in the first part of the chapter, he sees a cloud coming, a fire enfolding in itself. Remember what appeared to the Israelites, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. And a cloud, a pillar of cloud is like a whirlwind enfolding itself, like this, right? So when he sees the four living creatures and the firmament above their head, there's a throne. And on the throne, he sees one like unto the Son of Man. And he said, as the appearance of the bow, the rainbow, that is in the cloud in the day of rain. What, think about it. 
in, in Ezekiel uh, 38, he says Gog is coming like a storm, like a cloud to cover the land. That's what Joel said. It's a cloud that covers the land. That's this army that's coming. So think of it. Back in Genesis 9, God said, not if I bring a cloud over the land, but when I bring the cloud over the land. And I think that cloud is Gog and his army, his very evil, terrible army. God says he wants us to not worry because he says, I'm going to bring a cloud over the land. Gog and his army, evil, very bad thing that's going to happen. But he said, don't worry because I'm not going to forget my promise that I made. The token, my signature is on that covenant. And my signature is that when you see the cloud coming, you're going to see the bow in the cloud. Who's the bow? From this and from Ezekiel 1, the bow that is in the cloud the day of the rain, this is the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Now we know that that bow, 100%, no doubt in our mind, that rainbow in the cloud is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Now, I have a lot more to give you. No more time today. I'm going to stop it right here because we're going to pick this up next week and we're going to look at more places, more typology, more prophecies concerning the day of clouds that's coming. A storm is coming. A day of clouds is coming. And it's going to be a bad storm such as the world has never seen before. Now, in that cloud is a very, very bad type of rain. Only it's not water this time. It's fire. But don't fret, people. Don't worry. Because the rainbow doesn't just appear on a bright and sunny day, does it? No, never does. The rainbow only appears when the cloud comes, not before. So, it's going to be a bad day, an evil day. God said the day of the Lord is the day of clouds and thick darkness. And he said, woe to you that, that desire to the day of the Lord. Okay, because it's not going to be a good day. But... For those of us who trust and believe what God said, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. When you see these things come to pass, lift up your heads. Then you're going to see the Son of Man coming in that cloud. And it's going to be the brightness like the glory of the Lord, the rainbow. And when we see the rainbow, we're comforted. We know that's God still has his signature on his covenant and he's going to fulfill his word. So between now and next week, you get that Pure Bible Search software, you install it, you study clouds, cloud, clouds, cloudy, cloudier, I don't think that's in there either, just cloud asterisk. they will give you all the places in the Bible. You can study it yourself. And then maybe then you can start to see how this is going to unfold, how God is showing that he's revealing what exactly he's going to do in the last days and how he's going to do it. Because when you see that cloud, you're going to see Jesus in it. I promise you that. All right? So you study. You get involved. You learn some things. Maybe... When I do the next video, you'll find out that we had agreement here. Or maybe you'll find things that I never even saw in the scriptures. That's what I hope you do. All right. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed this. we got a lot more coming. Everything that I do, do it for the Lord and do it because of you. God bless you. Thank you.
for your love and your prayers for us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.